Apple just announced the latest version of the MacBook Pro. It's bigger, it's badder, it has power surpassing most other laptops out there, and that includes the biggest, beefiest gaming machines. But it's also not cheap, and for the majority of us, we probably don't need all of that power to calculate how to send various objects in orbit around the moon. So despite all of that hype and new tech, is it worth paying twice as much to buy the brand new MacBook Pro 14 over the much more budget-friendly M1 MacBook Air? Let's find out. What's up everyone, I'm the Everyday Dad, and if I can figure it out, you can figure it out. Yes, I know, I do not currently have the M1 Max MacBook Pro 14 in the studio as of yet, but honestly, I think it's pretty clearly laid out, and we can make some pretty solid recommendations even without having it physically here. It will be here in a couple of weeks, but it's not here right now. As the MacBook Pro is brand new, let's quickly jump into the specs and ordering options between the two so we kind of know where they stand. First off, the M1 MacBook Air can be had at a base model price of $999, or even less if you buy it refurbished. For that money, you'll get the 8-core M1 CPU, 7-core GPU, 8 gigabytes of unified memory, and a 256 gigabyte solid state drive. You can take this laptop up to an 8-core GPU, 16 gigabytes of unified memory, and a 2 terabyte solid state drive, bringing the total cost to $2,049. That's not cheap, but team, let me just tell you, if you think that's expensive, you better be buckling up for the rest of the video. Moving over to the MacBook Pro 14, that has a base model price of $19.99. For that money, you'll get the 8-core M1 Pro processor, 14-core GPU, 16 gigabytes of unified memory, and a 512 gigabyte solid state drive. This MacBook is the replacement for the higher-end 13-inch model from a couple of years ago that had the extra ports and the beefier cooling system. It's not a replacement for the lower-end MacBook Pro 13. Now, there are, if you look on the website, there are a ton of upgrade paths in the newest MacBook Pros, and I'm not going to run through everything today, but you could take that slightly demure system and bump Bump it up to the M1 Max processor variant with a 10 core CPU, 32 core GPU, 64 gigabytes of unified memory, and a whopping 8 terabyte solid state drive. And I hope, team, if you were buckled up, you're already sitting down, so don't worry about it. But if you're not, you sit down because the price of that is $58.99, which is legitimately about as much as I paid for my motorcycle. There are some other major updates that aren't necessarily covered in the specs, but we'll get to those as we talk about the computers. I hear you mentioning this in the comments right now. Obviously, much like when we talked about the iPhone SE and compared it to the iPhone 13 Pro Max, the MacBook Pro 14 is the technically superior device, but that doesn't mean it's the best option all of the time. Okay, so let's start with the physical differences between the two machines. The biggest difference on the body of the MacBook for me is while the MacBook Air only only has two Thunderbolt 3 ports, the MacBook Pro 14 will have so much more. On the one side, you'll get an SD card slot, a Thunderbolt 4 port, and full-size HDMI port. And on the other side, you'll get the MagSafe 3, two more Thunderbolt 4 spots, and a headphone jack. Team, Thunderbolt 4 is great. It's not that much different than Thunderbolt 3, but it does give you a couple key other features. But I gotta tell you, that HDMI might be worth buying the laptop by itself. You could you could call me crazy for that. You could call me crazy that, but for me in my day job, that cannot be overstated. Office professionals very often need to give briefings or presentations at other offices or on the road, and needing an HDMI dongle is such a big, it's not just a pain in the butt, it's a risk. And yes, all of life is mitigating risk, but you either risk losing the dongle, risk breaking the dongle, or risk bringing the wrong dongle to a meeting. I've said dongle way too often in that paragraph. When I would go out to meetings, I would always carry two of those adapters with me for redundancy, and it's something that I'm always worried about. I don't care if I have five adapters in my bag. I'm always worried that I'm not going to have what I need to do my presentation. And yes, you may have noticed in my videos, I'm a tad of an overthinker and an overworrier. But having those two Thunderbolt 3s by themselves literally causes me stress every day I need to prepare for a presentation. Yes, I also like having the SD card slot, but that's not as big of a deal. It'll be nice for travel YouTube stuff, but that's about it. I mean, a lot of media is now moving away from SD card anyway, so it'll be a nice to have, but not a need to have. MagSafe, I'm excited to see make a comeback, but you'll be able to charge the MacBook Pro from the Thunderbolt ports if you aren't into proprietary connections as well, which big thumbs up for me. And the other thing that I really like is here, compared to the MacBook Air and compared to the MacBook Pro 13, is not only do you get Thunderbolt 4 and the ability to use more than a single display, which is another huge benefit, but you get Thunderbolt ports on both sides of the laptop. If you were trying to fit a machine like this into a working from home dock situation, having your ports all on one side, it really kind of sucks. So with this new machine, you'll be able to spread out your cables a little better and potentially reach your monitor and dock without MacGyvering it up as much as needed on a previous M1 laptop. And you might not even need a dock with all the I.O. built into the laptop. Wow, Gary, that seems like an awful lot of reasons to buy the M1 MacBook Pro over the MacBook Air. And yes, 
I think the best part about these new computers is Apple really seemed to address all of the specific problems that I and others had with the last generation MacBook Pro and MacBook Air bodies. It's kind of like we've gone back to 2015 for the laptop bodies, and I'm okay with that. But I would say that the only real need to have here from my perspective is that HDMI port. And it's not an HDMI 2.1, it's HDMI 2.0, which is kind of disappointing. You can work around that other stuff pretty simply if you need to save some money on it. Another big physical difference between the two is the monitor itself. Apple really does seem to be moving all of its product lines over to mini LED displays that have wildly powerful brightness settings and contrast ratios. The new MacBook Pro 14 will be able to go up to a thousand nits of brightness compared to the 400 nits of brightness on the MacBook Air. That might not seem like a big gap if you're always using your laptops indoors, but if you try using your computer outdoors, it's very easy to have visual problems seeing the screen of the MacBook Air. If you're doing gaming or other fast motion activities, the screen can bump up to make sure you get the smoothest, cleanest operation. And if you are working on a document or reading a Twitter thread, it can go down to as low as 10 hertz to conserve battery life. And while I'm generally pretty skeptical about the need for 120 hertz on phone and tablet displays, I absolutely love having fast refresh rates on my computer monitors. There are real tangible benefits to having a faster refresh computer monitor to having my phone scroll a little faster. Plus this display will basically be a little pro XDR display built into the MacBook Pro itself and it's gonna be incredible. But if you aren't an HDR video editor or somebody using your MacBook Pro for competitive AAA gaming, and is there anybody, is there anybody that actually does that? If you are a competitive AAA gamer and you use a Mac, I have got to know. Let me know in the comments below. But again here, the screen would be a nice to have, but not necessarily a need to have, especially if the laptop's just gonna be plugged in as a desktop computer all the time anyway, you're never gonna see the monitor. And just a quick note before we move on to the internals, the MacBook Pro 14 will be almost a pound heavier than the MacBook Air. That doesn't sound like much, but if you are carrying this around a lot, that will definitely add up over time. Ounces equal pounds, my friends, but pounds also equal more pounds if it's that big of a difference. So pounds equal more pounds. We've got all the outside of the laptop. What about those internals? Here, while we don't have those specific numbers yet from the MacBook Pro, I think it's safe to say that it will dominate the MacBook Air in any of its configurations. Even if you were to put the two eight core processors against each other, the M1 Pro will still come out on top because of the way it's built. The M1 standard processor that we've seen for the past year has four high efficiency cores and four high performance cores. The eight core M1 Pro processor, wow, I can already tell now I'm gonna to come to hate saying that over the next year. That processor has six high power cores and two high efficiency cores. So even if you just look at the base model core count to core count, the M1 Pro will more than likely be far better in anything multi-core related like video editing. And with the latest advancements from Apple, I don't imagine that it will blow the M1 out of the water for single core, but I bet it will be leading it by a far margin. But the whole point of this video is to point out that even though the MacBook Pro will be the more powerful machine, so what? So what? Do you need all that power? Seriously, do you need all that power? Personally, I don't. If I didn't have this YouTube channel and wasn't gonna be buying these computers for content either way, I would undoubtedly not be buying these. The two parts of my life are YouTubing and project managering, and neither of those really needs this power or the ability to render the special effects from an Avengers movie. I've been using the eight core M1 processor in both my MacBook Air and my Mac mini for the past year to great effect. I love how powerful they are at their specific price point, and they blow previous pro level machines out of the water in video creation and reading those PDFs that I do every day. Even though they are the low end model in the Apple lineup, they are still so much better than a lot of other stuff on the market. Plus all of the power of the new pros will have a downside too, and that's gonna come into stark contrast in battery life. Yes, on the Apple website, they put the MacBook Pro 14 at 17 hours of battery life, and that's quite good. That is phenomenal battery life, and it's only one hour under the MacBook Air, but, that's also probably at the lowest end processor configuration. So anything above that, you will start suffering from less battery life. Look, the M1 standard MacBook Air and MacBook Pro have defined what good battery life on a piece of technology is. These have become the yardsticks for success. And that doesn't mean the yardstick moves if Apple releases something new. And I gotta tell you, if battery life is your main concern, these M1 standard machines will continue to be the best. But at the end of the day, so what, right? Yes, I'm excited for the MacBook Pro 14 to come in. I pre-ordered the base model almost immediately because that's like the computer that I've been waiting years to get. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best for everyone. 
the new MacBook Pros are probably the most niche computers in all of the Apple lineup. And I think it's gonna be a lot harder for me to recommend these to people than it was to recommend all of the lower end options because those lower end options have fantastic power, battery life, usability, and portability. And you can get them for legit budget friendly prices. If you need all the new port options from the new MacBooks, well then yeah, you have to either order one of those or I guess you can go out and get a 2015 MacBook Pro. But if you don't need those ports, I would recommend really looking at your power needs because these M1 standards are still very comparable to what else is on the market today and they will still continue to have very high recommendations for me. And if you like this video and you're a little more curious about the brand new MacBook Pros, here are my two impressions video running you through the full specs and ordering options of both the 14 and the 16. You can find them by clicking right here. Click, 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 click. Thanks for watching.